Originally, at Yule, an entire tree, and later a huge log, was dragged into the village or home to be ritually burned. It had to be kindled with a fragment of the previous year's log, and its fire was never permitted to go out by itself. Ancestral spirits were believed to be present in the fire and were honored by feeding the flames with food and drink. Odin was the greatest and wisest of the Norse gods. His wife was Frigga, goddess of fertility, and his son was Thor, god of thunder. Odin spent most of the year in the distant land of Valhalla, where he lived with the spirits of the great Viking heroes. But on the night of December 21st, they would all come back to Earth, originally like the Celtic Lord of the Dead, to gather up the souls of those who had died during the year, and later, under the influence of Christianity, to seek out evildoers. Odin, with his long white beard, led the hunt on his great white horse, carrying off naughty children in a howl of wind. That night, people in the Netherlands left out offerings of rain for Odin's horse and food for the spirits. But some Christmas customs carry us back to a stage of religion far earlier than Celtic and Norse mythology, to a time before people had anthropomorphic gods, when animals, plants, and forces of nature were regarded as incarnations of powerful spirits, a time whose dying beliefs have become superstitions or are labeled as witchcraft. So many traditions that we see today, we have absolutely no idea where they came from. You ever wonder why people use a bunny rabbit and in the springtime at Easter? Well, it's obvious because a bunny is mass reproduction. In the springtime, there were fertility festivals. Fertility, everything comes to life. I mean, I think the book of Jeremiah perfectly tells us what to do with these pagan ideas. Learn not the ways of the heathens. That's exactly what God told the Jews when he told them, when you come into the land that the God promised your fathers, don't do what the heathens do. I mean, they weren't even allowed to leave any of the unsaved people living in that land, but they didn't obey, and that's exactly what destroyed them. They were caught up in idolatry and tons of other sins. 
Remember Moses on Mount Sinai, Aaron at the foot of Mount Sinai? He made a golden calf to worship Jehovah with it. Lord, capital L-O-R-D. You know, one thing that just um, uh, never ceases to amaze me is these many unbelievers try to come up to me and say, you know, so many religions have... Um, very similar principles, similar concepts that all religions lead to God. As long as you have religion, you'll see God. And I believe that what's happening is these pagan ideas are just making people say, well, you know, did the stories in the Bible really, really happen? It's causing confusion. Christians ought to be holy, sanctified, ready to give an account for the hope that lies within them. We ought to be able to be able to tell people that um, we don't believe in all that stuff. Uh, we're separate. We're not like that. We're not mixing Christianity with paganism. Then we'll stand as a whole, very sanctified, and we'll stand out from among the crowd. We won't be like the heathen. I mean, if you think this is really bad, follow this legend of what people believed in Babylon right through the Roman Empire, and then take a good close look at what people have to say about Santa Claus. In the book of Zechariah, there's a scripture that says, ho, 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 he comes out of the north in Zechariah, and that word ho, ho, ho means cursed three times. What did God say about the brass serpent on the pole? He wanted it destroyed because people took that emblem and worshipped with, worshipped, worshipped that emblem. I mean, we need to get back to what the Bible really teaches. In parts of Europe during the last Stone Age and early Bronze Age, there lived a small, dark people who survived by hunting animals and gathering roots, fruit, and berries. Many of their gods took the forms of the animals which gave them life, and their priests, or shaman, wore ceremonial horns and sacred skins. The sacred horn and cloven hoof, later adopted by the church to depict the devil, was a symbol of good, and the horned god was the very first incarnation of Santa Claus. The killing and eating of a sacred animal or plant was not an offering to a god to gain his favor, but a sacrament, like the eating of the body and drinking of the blood of Christ at Mass and through contact with the divine life present in the animal or plant, one was blessed. Although the actual eating and drinking of the flesh and blood was the most perfect contact, blessings were also to be had through external contact when you were merely sprinkled with the blood, wore the hides, heads or horns of sacrificed beasts, or brought sacred sprigs and boughs into your home. Then, one day, strange giants over six feet tall, bringing iron and agriculture, entered the world of the little people, and most of them scattered. But some of their shaman mixed with the newcomers and became highly respected for their knowledge of herbs, as midwives and healers. Known as witches, they were also feared and hired for their knowledge of herbal poisons. And up until the 16th century, Every large British household had one of these witches on its staff. But when the Catholic Church initiated the great witch hunt, the remaining little people were forced to retreat, first to the heart of the ancient forests, then to marshes and inaccessible mountain areas, until, eventually, they faded into the mists of time, partly destroyed and partly absorbed by their conquerors. Expert archers and woodsmen Dressed in their forest green clothes, they blended into the forest, appearing and disappearing at a moment's notice. All this instilled a superstitious fear in their overlords that the little people were endowed with supernatural powers. At first, the little people were vindictive. They caused sickness, ruined crops, buildings caught fire, animals died, and children were stolen from their cots. Eventually, the farmers pacified them by putting out food for them. Their tools were made of wood, so few traces of their existence remain. Only tiny stone-tipped arrows or elf darts and hundreds of myths and legends. In Britain, they were known as elves, fairies, and goblins. In Norway, as the Nisser, and in Sweden, the Tomtar. Now, throughout most of the world, 
the little people have long been relegated to the realms of superstition. But in Scandinavia, to this very day, the bringer of gifts at Christmas is a tiny Yule goblin, the chief of the little people. With his little pointed cap, dressed all in red, he comes every year, and children leave out porridge to keep him in good humor. And in North America, everybody knows that the little people are alive and well and living in the North Pole. There, they are happily employed in Santa's workshop, making toys for the children of the world. By the third century, the church fathers threw up their hands in despair of ever completely eliminating the celebration of Saturnalia. It was far too popular. Instead, they decided to adopt most of the pagan traditions, baptize them with Christian meaning, and reorient the entire festival toward the Christian sun of righteousness. The date of Christ's birthday was chosen to compete with the pagan celebrations of December 25th, sacred not only to the Romans, but also to the Persian religion of Mithraism, whose followers worshipped the sun and celebrated the return of its strength on that day, and which in those days was one of Christianity's strongest rivals. Decorating houses and churches with evergreen boughs was explained by quoting the prophet Isaiah, who had predicted the day when, glory of Lebanon shall come unto you, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box tree, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. The evergreen boughs of the Christmas wreath became symbolic of the everlasting life which Jesus Christ's birth promised to the faithful, and its circular shape was a reminder of the crown of thorns placed on his head when he was crucified. Holly now symbolized eternal life, its bright red berries represented the drops of blood Jesus shed on the cross. Their color also represented the burning love for God present in the hearts of the faithful. The prickly leaves remind us of his crown of thorns. Later, during the Middle Ages, the red berries of the holly were believed to keep witches away, and holly became the traditional lucky evergreen for wreath making. Only mistletoe, the pagan's most sacred symbol of fertility, was entirely banned from the church. The Christmas tree, as we know it, began in Germany in the year 718, when St. Boniface arrived from England to convert the pagans. Determined to root out all that was heathen, he cut down a sacred oak in the city of Giesmar. To pacify the angry worshippers, he planted a fir tree in its place and declared this to be a symbol of their new faith. It so happened that this took place on Christmas Eve. Christianity also claimed most of the pagan fire rituals, maintaining that the lighting of candles and the burning of the Yule log symbolized the divine light believed to illuminate the world. Exchanging gifts was said to relate to the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that the wise men carried with them from the east when they came to pay homage to the newborn Christ. And the tradition of singing at Christmas, from the idea that angels sang when they appeared to the shepherds at Bethlehem to announce Christ's birth. By the 16th century, carols were sung only at Christmas time by the bishop and the clergy. And the subject of the carols related only to the Christmas story. But carols rapidly became popular amongst the general public and were soon sung on the streets and other public places. And